We're good. Okay, sorry. Uh, you have to wait for next week for more jokes. All right. Good morning to everyone. Good morning to everyone, and welcome to The Well here at STSA. We are in part two of a series that is entitled The Best is Yet to Come, studying the book of Ruth. Who here is excited about the best being yet to come? Who said, I'm excited for the best? No, say, I'm excited for the best. I'm excited for the best. Say again, I'm excited for the best. I'm excited for the best. If you're not excited for the best, that means that either you haven't hit the worst quite yet, okay, or you don't know what you're missing out on because the best is yet to come, and everyone, that's the whole point of this series, every one of us at some point in our life, and many of us today would say that where we're at right now in our life, man, like, we love God, and we trust God, and we love everything, and we're doing our best, but man, it just seems like life keeps hitting us and hitting us and hitting us and hitting us, and that's why we say the best is yet to come, and that's what this whole series is all about. If you were here last week in part one, we looked at Ruth chapter one, and we ended chapter one last week. Okay, for those who are here, Naomi was our central character last week. We didn't talk too much about Ruth. We'll see her more today. Naomi had a rough week last week, shall we say. First chapter of Ruth, Naomi, about as many bad things, you know, like the whole you want to, want to get away, like everything bad happening, that was Naomi. Start Naomi, Naomi and her family, their ordinary family from Bethlehem. All of a sudden, a famine hits. Famine hits, that's a difficult situation. They move to a city called Moab. As soon as they get to Moab, first tragedy happens, her husband dies. That's okay, she's still got two sons. Well, within about 15 minutes, those sons die as well. And, one, and now the two daughters-in-law that the sons had married, one of them leaves. So basically, Naomi had lost her country, lost her homeland, lost her, her society and all her friends. She lost her husband. She lost son number one. She lost son number two. She lost daughter-in-law number one. And all she was left with was Ruth, her final daughter-in-law. And that's why it led Naomi to say this at the end of chapter one. She said, do not call me Naomi. Naomi means sweet or pleasant. Do not call me sweet or pleasant. Call me Mara. Mara means bitter. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home empty, again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? Naomi was in such a bad place, so defeated. Maybe you've been there. She couldn't see any good. She couldn't see any glimmer of hope. All she could see is that everything in life is bad, and even the Almighty himself is against me. But that's exactly what makes the story of Ruth so beautiful, is that in these dark, dark, dark circumstances, our key thought for this series, say this together with me, all together, just around the corner from the worst is God's best. I didn't hear anybody except myself. Again, just around the corner from the worst is God's best. This is, the, this is what makes this story so beautiful, is the darkness is what makes the light shine that much more brightly. And what we're going to see here throughout this series is that just around the corner from the worst is, is God's best. And just because you can't see God's best about to come doesn't mean it's not there. It just means simply that you can't see it. Imagine it this way. Imagine here I am, okay, and I'm here on this stage, and I'm walking on this stage, and every step is the same. This step looks like I'm just looking down like this because I can't see. I'm just looking down. This step looks like this step. This step looks like this step. And this one looks like this. And th each step is painful and painful. But you know what? What's going to happen eventually, let's imagine the end of that stage is not a cliff where I would fall off, but like a, a beach or something like that, something very good. The reward is over there. You can't see the difference between this step and this step. And then this step and this step. But if you keep going, if you keep going, eventually you're going to turn a corner. And once you turn that corner, it's going to be beautiful. But here's the important part. Just because I don't see myself getting closer to the corner doesn't mean that I'm not getting closer to the corner. Does that make sense? Just because I see, I don't see myself getting closer to the corner doesn't mean I'm not. And in fact, every step that I'm taking here, this is a painful step. It's a painful step. But even though it's painful, it's getting me closer to ultimately turning that corner as long as we don't give up. And the problem that I see so often I don't know this because I'm not God and you don't know this, but how many times, you don't know, how many people give up, give up right before they're about to turn the corner? How many times you get so close that you don't realize, you're just like, I've been walking this road forever and it's so painful, I can't take it anymore. But you don't know what's just around the corner from where you are right now, but God does. And thankfully, Naomi doesn't give up on God. Okay, she expressed her bitterness towards God, but like we talked about last week, we're not going to judge her for it. She was in a tough time. 
What she was doing, she was being real with God. And God wants us to be real with him and express our frustration, our sadness, our disappointment, but still go to him. Like I always say, we want to make sure when our tough times, we talk to God, not about God. We talk to God, not about God. We don't say God has left me and God has... We go to God and we say, God, I don't know why you did this, but I still trust you. You're the almighty God. And because she did that, we're going to start to see the goodness of God shining through today. Actually, to be honest, last week, even though it ended very dark, there actually was a lot of goodness of God last week, but she just, you couldn't see it because there was so much dark. But for the keen eye, there was God's goodness last week. Where did you see God's goodness last week? The obvious way was Ruth. Like, even though the lady couldn't see only dark, only dark, but what she didn't see is that, hey, Ruth, even though my other daughter-in-law left me, Ruth decided to stick with me. And that's exactly what it means to walk by faith. Walk by faith means that no matter how dark it is, we trust that God is working. Walk by faith, which is something that all Christians, that, like that's supposed to be what we do. We walk by faith, not by sight. It's not just words that we say. It means that we trust and we believe, watch this, even when we don't agree. That's the hard part. We trust God is working even when we don't agree with what he's doing. We believe that God is working all things together for good to those who love his name, even when we don't agree with the path he's taking to get us. And in fact, not even when we don't agree, especially when we don't agree. Because if we agree, that's not faith. That's just agreement. That's just saying, God, you did a good job. Walk by faith means that I realize that God doesn't have to report to me. I don't go to God and say, God, what did you do? Okay, and when is this going to be done? What did you do today about this problem, God? Nothing? Again? Walk by faith. Says God, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know when you're going to finish. I don't even know when you're going to start. But I trust. I don't agree, but I trust. I don't understand, but I trust. And if you do that, then you're eventually going to get to our theme verse from this series, which is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, which says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. That's, that's what Naomi's going to see. That's what we're going to see through Ruth, is that God isn't limited by what we see. We see here, we see these are the circumstances, the best it can get to here. And then maybe on a good day it can get to here. And then maybe if all works out well, get to here. But God, no, no, no. God sees exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. We're going to read chapter 2 together, and you tell me if this verse is true or not true by the end of today. Okay, so let's pick up the story of Ruth. Chapter 2, we finished last week. Like I said, all the bad stuff for Naomi. Ruth comes to her and says, even though the other daughter-in-law left, even though the sons died, even though I'm a Moabite, and you are going to go back to Bethlehem, which I don't belong there, where you go, I will go. Where you die, I will die. Your people is my people. Your God will be my God. They probably shared a hug in a moment or whatever it may be, and then they started trekking back on the road to Bethlehem, and that's where we would pick up the story in Ruth chapter 2, verse 1. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. Let's stop right here. This is the first verse of chapter 2. Last week, if you remember, Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, don't come back with me because I don't have any more relatives. Everyone in our family is gone. There's no one to marry you. But what we see here in the first verse is Naomi was actually wrong. She did have a relative. Her husband had a relative, and his name was Boaz. So what this is, the first thing where I see here, okay, we'll get to who Boaz in a second. But what you see is, like I said, last week, there was all these dark clouds, and it was just darkness, 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 darkness. But then all of a sudden, verse 1, there was a relative. His name was Boaz. So you know what that is? That's not a solution to any problem. Not yet, at least. What that is, is a ray of light just cracked through the cloud. You see that? A ray of light. Now, why am, why am I pointing this out? It's because I think God does this all the time. I actually think this is like my job as a priest. My job, I do not solve anyone's problems. I barely solve my own. I can't, I can do, my job is when you come to me in darkness to ask enough questions to see, well, maybe there is a ray of light somewhere. Maybe there is a ray of light. You're like, but that's all the way. All I need is a ray of light. And that's what we see right here, a glimmer of hope. In other words, maybe, is that the road bending? 
like Boaz, is, that the, is, the, is the road turning? I can't see it. I'm still kind of far. But I have hope that if I keep walking, there's going to be a turn at some point. Elimelech had a relative. His name was Boaz. And it says here, a man of great wealth. Other translations say a man of good standing, meaning he was an honorable man, a dignified man, a successful financially, okay, but also a godly man. We'll see that in a little bit. Meaning he's not just some schmuck off the street. Okay, he's not some guy who is like in need of immigration papers or something like that. That's why, or some guy living in his parents' basement to find himself or something. Like, this is a catch, okay? And it just so happens that this guy who's a catch, who's an honorable man of good standing, happens to be single. Those are the best kind, isn't it? Verse 2. So Ruth the Moabite, Moabitess, it's a very hard word to say. So Ruth, the lady from Moab, said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. So Naomi doesn't know anything about Boaz yet, okay? Doesn't just sit back. Now they're here in in Bethlehem. And Naomi says, I'm not just here to like hug you and say, I feel so bad for you. And we're just going to die here together. I'm here to work. I'm here to roll up my sleeves. Like, let's go. Like, you can't take care of yourself. I'm going to take care of you. I'm here. To, 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 to provide for you financially. And she says, let me go to the fields and glean. This is an honorable way for her to try to provide for her family. How do you think most widows during these ancient times would provide financially? How, how were they forced? What were they forced oftentimes into to provide financially when they had no man to support them? prostitution that was the general route that they had to take because they had no means that they could do anything but ruth says we're gonna do this the godly way we're gonna do our best we're gonna roll up our sleeves and she okay in a man's world she says i'm gonna do my part so she says let me go into a field and glean heads of grain you may the concept of gleaning okay you can read about this in leviticus chapter 19 if you want god had instituted a law with his people It was basically God's way of like welfare or God's way of taking care of the poor. So if I owned a field and I'm a rich landowner and it's time for harvest, I, you know, I get my basket and I shake the grapes to go in there and I shake the whatever to go in there. And as I'm doing that, some stuff is going to fall on the ground. And what God said is, don't pick it up. Leave it. Leave it for the poor person. Leave it for the traveler. Leave it for the widow or for the orphan. You shake and you fill it up because that's your stuff, but what's fallen, you leave it. And that was God's way of hardwiring into the society, the strong help the weak, the rich help the poor. So that's what she's doing. She's going to go into the field, and whatever's on the ground was fair game for her to take. Verse 3. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come, emphasize, happened to come, to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Eli Melech. Happened to come to that part of the field. I said this last week. If you like action adventure, like who, like I'm an action adventure movie kind of a guy, I like Mission Impossible movies, Jason Bourne, those kind of movies like action adventure. I'm not a rom-com kind of a guy. Ever we have rom-com people here? Okay, some rom-com people. Okay, so... If you are action adventure, Ruth is not necessarily the story for you. You would love like the stories of the wars and things like that. If you're a rom-com, Ruth is a rom-com. It's a biblical rom-com. Because what you see in it is no, like I said, no fighting, no miracles, no supernatural. But it's impossible to miss the, quote, coincidences that continue to happen. Like here it says that she went in the field to glean, and it just so happened that she came into Boaz's field. Like, if this happened in a movie, you'd watch, this is how I am when I watch those funny rom-coms. I'm like, that would never happen. That's not, like, I'm, I'm a very miserable person to watch a movie with, okay? Because I'm like, th- 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 like, if this actually was in a movie, you'd be like, that's cheesy. Yeah, she just happens to go in the one field that that guy, they're going to fall out. Like, you wouldn't believe it. This is like in the, 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 the Greek fat big wedding, big fat Greek wedding, okay? Where what are the chances that the cute guy from the diner just happens to walk on the street or the place that you work and you have, like, just in, in a movie, you're like, this would never happen. 
But it happens here. You know why it happens here? Because God is making it happen. God is, like, God is not sitting back. We talked about this verse life. God is not asleep. God is not out to lunch. God is not like, oh, yeah, what was her name, Naomi, Ruth? Oh, yeah, I remember them. I looked for their card somewhere. That's not God. God is working. 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 We don't see it. I mean, he's not working. He's always working behind the scenes. And what here he's doing, he is intervening. He's manipulating circumstances. He is guiding steps. He is putting people here. He is taking people out of there. That other lady who wanted to glean, he pushed her over to that other field. When Boaz needed to go to the bathroom, God said, made, no, don't go to the bathroom now. You're going to go into the field. I go to the bathroom. Like God is working. God is working. God is working. There's a verse in the book of Proverbs that says, many are the plans of a man's heart, but the Lord directs his steps. I feel that here so much. Is that regardless of what our plans, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and God's like, oh, okay, okay. But God is directing our steps, guiding our path. In other words, nothing is random. Nothing is by chance. Nothing has just happened. You know what's happening? The maestro. The great maestro of the universe. You know that, that our universe is not random. Our universe is not chaos. Our universe is under the control of the maestro. And the same way, there's the orchestra right there, and you don't see, but the maestro's like, you know, violin, up, 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 okay, violin down. And then he's like, you know, tuba, up, okay, and then, you know, banjo down, like whatever it is. Like he's manipulating, and he's moving, and that's, what, that's what's happening. And you don't see it. You just see the different individual actors. You don't see the maestro that's moving. That's what we see right here. God moves in big ways, parting the Red Sea, manna from heaven, Walking on water. God works in big ways. But this is so important. God also works in small ways. That just so happen to be the field. The Boaz just so happened. And I guess it's kind of our key thought for today. Oh, that's the wrong PowerPoint. That's, that's okay. That's okay. That's Father Timothy's PowerPoint. The right, okay, what I wanted to say. Repeat after me. God uses natural circumstances. God uses natural circumstances to bring about supernatural plans. Again, God uses natural circumstances to bring about supernatural plans. We want big miracles. No, no, sorry, no, we're done with repeating. Sorry, <laughs> thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that, though. We want big miracles. We want, I have a problem at work. Zap my boss. Boom. Just lightning. Boom. Right there. We want big signs, big miracles, big acts of God. But I'm telling you, 99% of the time, the supernatural plans of God are implemented through very natural, ordinary, run-of-the-mill, day-to-day events. A phone call that just happened to come at that time. Why that phone rang at that time when I was about... Uh, a, a conversation with a person. Why did you bring that up to me right now? I, a, a run-in with somebody that you weren't expecting to see and you didn't think you'd ever see, but that person, God had a message to you from that person. Sometimes, to be honest, it's not even that much. It's a gut feel that you just can't shake. Ordinary. But you lie in your bed and you just can't shake that uneasy feeling. That's God working. That's the maestro. It's not big. I'm not saying it can't be big. God can, of course, do big. But I'm telling you, 99% of the time, God uses natural circumstances to bring about supernatural plans. Untrained eyes don't see that. The untrained eye sees, oh, it was a coincidence. Oh, it just must have been luck. Oh, that gut feel, it must have been that pizza I ate last night. No, it's not the pizza. Sometimes it's the pizza, but it's not always the pizza. Maybe it's the Holy Spirit who's telling you, Something's off here. Because the same God who allowed the famine, the same God who watched and did nothing, as we think, when the husband died and the son died and the other son died, the same God who was overseeing that when all that happened is the same God who was overseeing, put Boaz here, stick Ruth over there, let him catch her eye. Let her catch his eye. Only God can do that. Let's continue our, our story. Whoops, sorry. Right here. Verse 4. 
Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless you. So now Boaz comes to the field, and this seems like a trivial verse. Like it, no, no, no action happens here, but I'm pausing here for a particular reason. Boaz comes to the field, and he says to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless you. If you want to know a man's relationship with God, I told you Boaz is going to be a godly person. You can see the godliness of Boaz from the first time we see him on the stage right here. If you want to know a man's relationship to God, don't see what he does on Sunday. Don't ask him about his beliefs and his theology. Watch him on a day-to-day -day basis. Because what we here see with Boaz, this is just Boaz showing up at work and saying good morning to the employees. But he does it prayerfully, and he does it in a, in a godly way. I always say this, okay, to single people. If we have any single people here or single people watching on the other side of the camera. Sometimes someone comes to me and says, I met a guy. I met a girl. Okay, tell me about him. Oh, he's so cute. Okay, oh, she's so funny, whatever. His eyes and her nose and her ear, whatever, maybe. And I'm like, okay, that's great. You know, great about the eyes and the nose. Like, that's great. And uh, tell, But tell me about, like, tell me, like, what are they like? Oh, and they're funny. And they're, okay, but are they close to God? And then when I hear this, I'll tell you what I don't want to hear. I don't know. Hasn't come up. No, hasn't come up. There's a reason why it hasn't come up. If you don't know a person's relationship with God after spending two, three dates with them, then I got news for you. It's probably not there. Because can anybody, like we speak about what's most important to us. People like to talk about the things that are important to them. So for example, can anybody listen to my sermons regularly and not know that I love my wife, that I love my kids, and I love my football team? Even though I hate my football team right now, but I, that I have a complicated relationship with my football team. Like, you can't listen to my sermons and be like, I don't know how Father Anthony feels about football. Like, you know. I don't know how he feels. Does he have a wife? Does he have kids? Because I talk about it all the time. Because they're very important to me. I wrote this down right here. This is especially for the single people. What you love shines through. So if you don't know, then you do know. And he's a no-no. If you don't know, then you do know he's a no-no. Or she could be a no-no as well. Here we see what Boaz walks into work, starts with a prayer. Verse 5. Then Boaz said to his servant, who is in charge of the reapers? Or said to his servant who is in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? So Boaz, kind of, whose lady is that? And if Facebook was around at the time, he would have begun the Facebook stalking. Okay, he's gathering information, okay? And he started to Google over here and Facebook over here and check out her Instagram and Who's that lady, that lady over there? Tell me about who got any information. Verse 6. So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is a young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. So Boaz asked for the report. The servants say, She's that lady who came from Moab. She's been working all day. She seems to be a hard worker. So Boaz says, you know what? Guys, take note. Single guys especially take note. He doesn't fast and pray, okay? He doesn't ask his buddies. He doesn't say, I'm not sure. Look, Boaz, make your move. And Boaz, boom, okay, makes his move. From verse 6, he met her. In verse 8, he's about to make his move right now with a very smooth line right now. Look how Boaz, look at his pickup line. He comes over here. And Boaz, this is a rom-com. Boaz said to Ruth, you will not, you will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Oh, what a smooth line that is. Stay close by my young women. That's his pickup line. And they say, that's a good line. So again, single guys, write that one down. Stay close by my young women. Do not go into another field. Verse 9. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So what happens right here is Boaz tells her, you don't go to any other field. You want to glean? You glean here. And we're going to protect you. Because again, she's a, a widowed woman. She's in hostile, like a, a woman without a husband like this in the field, anyone can do whatever they want to her. He said, you're protected here. And if you're thirsty, 
my servants will get you a drink. That's good treatment for a servant girl, a widowed girl from Moab. <clears throat> Just one question. Just one question for you to think about as we read the next verse, but I want you to think as we go through this. Why Boaz is so into Ruth? Like, where did this come from? Like, she just shows up. She didn't expect anything. Day one on the job. There's a guy. He happens to be my relative. He happens to be rich. And he happens to be into me. Like, think of all those factors that just happened. He happens to be my relative. He happens to be rich. And he happens to be, I'm his type of girl. What are the odds? What are the odds? The answer? That's the divine hand of God. What are you talking about odds? There's no odds. It's a thousand percent. With God, there's no limitation. God's not like, let me see if I can find a guy. There's no good guys. And God's like, ah, all the good guys are taken. That's not God. God has unlimited, exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, unlimited resources. Verse 10. So she fell on her face, bowed to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes? She asked the same question we're asking. Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Ruth is asking the same question I am. Why is Boaz into Ruth? Think of all that Ruth has going against her. Number one, she's a foreigner. She's a Moabite. Israelites hate Moabites. She got that going against her. Number two, she's a widow. Why is widow bad? Because widow means she's not a virgin. And back in those days, a woman who was not a virgin was not given very much honor. You just throw her to the side. That's why, like I said, they oftentimes turn to prostitution because no guy, like why would the guy want the, the, non, the, the, the non-virgin lady? She's homeless. She's destitute. She's unskilled and untrained. Like she didn't have any real value that she could offer. And worst of all, she comes with baggage, serious baggage. You know what the baggage is that she carries with her to her husband? You know what she's going to bring? Her mother-in-law, with all due respect to mine, okay? <laughs> she bringing a mother-in-law with her. Like she has very little to offer. So here's the question I want you to think about. And I want, I want you to really think of an answer. I'm going to give you my answer in a little bit. Why was he so nice to her? Why was he so into her? Rich, successful man could have had his pick of the litter. Why? Love at first sight. The rom-com people. Uh. Was it because she was such a hard worker? He'd never seen anyone carry grapes the way she carried those grapes. You want to know why? Next verse tells us. Verse 11 and 12. It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. So first it starts off by him saying, I know what you did. I know you left your father and your mother and your land. You did all that for Naomi's sake. I heard about you. But here's the important part. He's not saying, I'm into you. You're about to see this in the next verse. I'm not into you because you're a kind person or a humble person. Listen what those things revealed to Boaz about who Ruth is. He says, the Lord repay you your work. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. That's the key phrase. Under whose wings you have come for refuge. What allowed Ruth to find favor? First of all, what allowed Ruth to find favor of God and to be blessed by God and taken care of by God and to find the favor of Boaz here in this passage? Boaz's words here. Okay, Boaz, okay, without getting too much into it, Boaz is like a type of Christ. He is a foreshadowing of Christ in many ways. He's like a, 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 his character here, okay, is very Christ-like. So when Boaz is speaking here, this is really God speaking through Boaz. This is God saying to Ruth, the Lord repay you your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Said another way, what Boaz, what Christ 
speaking through Boaz, is saying, you, Ruth, will be blessed by the one whose wings you have sought refuge under. You will be blessed by the one whose wings you have sought refuge under. So said another way. If you, Ruth, choose to take refuge under money, then let money take care of you. If you choose to rely on money, take refuge in money, money, good luck getting money to bail you out. If you rely on your experience, if you rely on your skills, like you will be rewarded by whatever you choose to take refuge underneath. So you choose. And you, Ruth, have chosen, I will take refuge under the wings of God. I will stand by my God, and I will do what he says, and I will trust him with the outcome. And therefore, you will be blessed. <clears throat> what Ruth did right here, okay, I, honestly, I can't, I can't overvalue what R Ruth did here in this passage. Ruth didn't complain when her husband died. Ruth didn't complain that she had to leave everything. Ruth didn't say, woe is me. Ruth didn't say God is against, like Ruth didn't do any of that stuff. Ruth said, I'm going to do, I'm, I'm do what God calls me to do, and I'm going to trust him with the results. Like, I, honestly, I'm going to put what Ruth did on the same level as Abraham when he left his land. And I could even make the case, actually, what she did is even harder, because he was at least a man he could make something for himself. I'm going to put what Ruth did right here on the same level as when Moses stood in front of Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Because Ruth knew that she's a Moabite going into that foreign land. They kill her easy, and they would do so in the name of God. I'm going to put what Ruth did as far as courage. I'm going to put her like Joshua when, she led the, when he led the people into the promised land and battled the bad guys. That was Ruth, but she didn't have an army. She went on her own, but she didn't go on her own. She went under the wings of him who she has come to for refuge. If I had to put words to the mindset of Ruth, I would say this is what Ruth, how she lived her life. Ruth lived her life by she said, I'm going to obey God and trust him with the consequences. Repeat after me. Say, obey God and trust him with the consequences. Obey God and trust him with the consequences. Boaz, this is so important. Boaz is not rewarding Ruth. God is rewarding Ruth. Boaz is not rewarding Ruth. God is rewarding Ruth. And even I'm going to go a step further and follow me here. This one's going to be a little bit tough, but you're smart people. I actually don't even think God is rewarding Ruth. That's how we look at it. I think Ruth is rewarding Ruth. I don't think God is rewarding Ruth. I think Ruth is reaping the consequences of her decision to trust in God. Like, follow me here on this one. We look at the world in a very self-centered way. Everything revolves around me. I'm the sun and the moon and the stars, and God is just kind of an extra supporting cast, okay? We look at it as, if I do X, God's going to do Y. And if I do this, then God's going to do this. So if I do something nice, God will give me something nice. If I do something bad, God will put me in a bad place. That's how we look at the world. We, we are the primary actors. I don't think that's the way the world works. I don't think it's centered around me. I think it's centered around him. A God-centered view, think of it differently, is God is moving through the world. God is acting. God is, 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 is accomplishing. And if we stand in his path and we follow his path, we will be blessed. And if we try to stand in front of him or go against him or go the opposite direction, then we will be cursed. Not because God is saying, curse that, bless that. No, 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 no. God is moving. God is working. God is acting. And the one who stays under the wings will always find blessing and protection and security. That's actually what the expression means. Think of it like a large eagle, okay, with big wings, okay, big old eagle with the big old wings. Then you got a little baby eagle. I think it's called an eaglet, that's what I think it's called. A little baby eagle. And that baby eagle, just stay under the wing, man. Just stay under the wings. As long as you're under the wings, you're good to go. I'm not saying stay under the wing and I'm going to bless you. No, no, no. I'm saying stay under the wing, you will be blessed. Okay, and then now all of a sudden, my wings turned over here to the left. Stay with me to the left. Now I'm here turning to the right. Stay to the right. You stay under there, I'm not blessing you. You are blessing yourself. <clears throat> That's why you've heard me say this before. The right prayer, the right prayer 
is not, God, bless my job. It's God, show me the job that you want to bless. It's not God, I want to marry this girl, I want to marry this boy, please bless it. That's not the right prayer. The right prayer is God. Which of these girls or boys is the one that you want to bless? And I'm going to walk there. Like not, this is mine, bless it. This is my decision, bless this decision. No, show me the decision. Show me the decision that you said, that's the place of blessing. If you take this, that's the place where I will, will bless you and keep you and protect you. Another example. Think of like a lighthouse. Okay, like a big lighthouse in the middle of the ocean where it's very, very dark, pitch dark, and you can't see anything. What does a lighthouse do? A lighthouse shines a light, okay? So right here, you're a boat, and you can't see anything. It's like, it's like you can't see anything. So what I do is I want to lead you to safety. So what I do is I put the light right there, and you go to that light. And then I just move the light. And all you do is you stay, as long as you stay in the light, you're going to be safe. I'm guiding you, and I'm leading you. I'm not saying, you better follow me, or I'm going to hurt you. What I'm saying is, you better follow me, you're going to hurt yourself. Because if you go where it's dark, good luck to you. I know all bets off. But I'm the lighthouse. I know the path. I am working. I am guiding you. And it's usually not a straight path. And sometimes it's going to take you in a direction. You say, I don't know why that direction. Trust the lighthouse. Obey God. Trust him with the consequences. Obey God. Trust him with the consequences. Say after me. Say, obey God and trust him with the consequences. That's how we live life. We're going to obey God and we're going to trust him with the consequences. So if obey God means, make it practical now, obey God means quit the job, then quit the job. But what am I going to, trust him with the consequences. How am I going to, trust him, trust him with the consequences. If obey God means quit, quit. Trust him with the consequences. If obey God means end the relationship, because it's not a godly relationship, but what am I going to do and where am I going to find? You obey God, you trust him with the consequences. And if you're married, that's not the advice for you. It's the opposite advice. is that you should stay in it and you fight for it. Why? But he did and she did. You obey God and you trust him with the consequences. That's all we got in this world. All we got is the wings of, the, of, 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 of God. And as long as we stay under there, we don't know how. Obey God and trust him with the consequences. Apologize when he says to apologize. But she didn't, he did. Apologize. Forgive. Obey God, trust him with the consequences. And what you will see, as I said earlier, is you will see God uses ordinary, ordinary circumstances, ordinary actions, ordinary decisions to accomplish extraordinary, supernatural plans that he has in store for us. Psalm 91 is a beautiful psalm that talks about this concept. He says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. That's what Ruth did. That's what Ruth did. She said, I am just a, a Moabite woman with no skill or no training. I am not going to make it out there in this world. So God... I'm going to stay under the shadow of your wings. I'm going to just stay here. And where you lead, I'm going to go. And I may not see the connection. And I may not understand why I needed to leave my father and mother. Why I needed to go to these people who hate my guts. Why all this bad stuff? I may not see it. But God, if that's where your wing is going, then I will follow your wing. I will obey God. And I will trust in him for the consequences. No one who ever obeyed God and trusted him ever regretted it. Let's go back to our story with Boaz, verse 12. This is what he said to her. This is the last verse that we read. The Lord repay your work, and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. You know what that is? What is Boaz saying right here? A full reward be given you? That's the best. That's God's best. Remember we said just around the corner from the worst is God's best? Well, Boaz is saying... You lady, even though you haven't accomplished, you haven't achieved anything, you haven't received anything, you lady, just around the corner from the worst, you're about to see God's best. And basically from there, we won't read the rest of the passage. You can read the rest of the chapter when you go home, but you can probably figure out where it goes after that. Okay, Boaz tells his men, this lady, 
She's one of, she's, she's, I got my eye on her. So when you see her coming, Boaz tells his servants, drop a little extra grapes over here. Be a little clumsy over here and knock this down because Ruth could not take it off the bush. So he told them, drop extra on the ground whenever she comes. Ruth goes home, tells her mom. My mom says, Naomi says, how was your day? And Ruth says, you'll never guess who I met. You'll never believe who I ran into. You'll never believe how my day was. And we'll say, cheesy, cheesy, cheesy. But that's how it works when it comes to God. And at the end of the, of the after she tells that to her mother-in-law, Naomi says this, verse 20. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And again, what Naomi is doing here is she is speaking prophetically. God is speaking through her, saying, blessed is the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And this is where chapter two ends. Do you remember where chapter one ended? Chapter one ended also with a word from Naomi about her circumstances, but that was, God is against me. God has afflicted me. I'm a bitter person. And now look at her. This is why, by the way, last week, when I said what Naomi did was good, that she took it to God and she kind of blamed God. Remember I said she blamed God, but we said not blamed and they like it's his fault, but it's his responsibility. Why that's so important? Because now the same blame, it's his responsibility. Now when good happens, I blame God. Like she didn't say, whoo, we got lucky. That worked out well. She didn't say it was just coincidence. She said the same God who I saw with the famine, who I saw with the death, that's the same God who gave me Boaz. The same God who caused the problem, that's the same one who is now giving me the solution in front of my very eyes. That's what life under the wings means. It means I see all things as from his hand. Nothing is by chance. The maestro is working. And next week, we'll see. You again, like you, you could guess where this goes after this, okay? The wheels of God's providence are in motion. Ruth and Boaz have a little thing happening next week. Don't miss that one, especially like I said, if you're into the rom-com, you're going to have, have some fun with that next week. But what I want to say is, there's still two more chapters in the book. The story is pretty much done here. The hard part is done, I should say. The hard part is done. The hard part is getting through the dark, trusting in God. I'm going to stay under your wings. The rest is easy. The rest is just like, you know, just uh, doing the, the final touches at the end. The hard part was what she already did right here. I'm staying under this wings. Ruth, you can do this. I'm staying under the wings. Ruth, what about this? I'm staying under the wings. She made that decision. And in the end, it's going to work out pretty good for her. And in case you're wondering, what does it mean to be under the wings of God? Well, Jesus spoke in the New Testament in Luke chapter 13 about a group of people. And he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. But you were not willing. All God wants, all he wanted for Ruth, all he wanted for these people in, the, in the Jerusalem in the New Testament, all he wants for me and you, he only wants one thing, stay under the wings. Stay under the wings. If you're under the wings, I know you're safe. If you're under the wings, I know you're going to end up in the right place. But they weren't willing. So my question to you, I'll leave you with this thought to kind of think about, is are you willing to stay under the wings, and I try to make that practical. Are you willing to stop telling God what is right and wrong and start following where he leads? Are you willing to stop treating him as if he works for you and instead see that he is guiding us in ways that we'll never understand? Are you willing to concede, grudgingly concede, that maybe your plan isn't the best plan and that maybe God, even though his his path is very rarely a straight line between two points. But God's kind of windy road. Are you willing to concede that maybe he knows what he's doing? Are you willing to pray, God, I trust you. Lead me to the place of blessing, even if I don't want to go there. Lead me, Lord, even though I don't want it. That's what it means to take refuge under his wings.
is to obey him, to trust him for the consequences, and always know, always know that God, 24-7, always know that God is using ordinary circumstances to accomplish his extraordinary supernatural plans. And if we trust him and we stick with him, do you know what we're going to discover one day? We're going to come to realize that one day, that just around the corner from the worst is God's best. I'm excited to hit God's best, and I know that you are as well. Let's make sure we trust in those wings, we stay under those wings, and I promise you, God never leaves us and leads us in a bad direction. Let's stand together for a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you because your wings are big enough for all of us to fit under. And we know that you're always guiding us and leading us and protecting us in ways that we'll never understand. Help us, Lord, like Ruth, to obey you and trust you for the consequences. You know how hard that is, Lord, for us. How hard for us to let go and to truly trust you because we see the negative things, but we will obey you and trust you for the consequences and leave it in your hands. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this study. We pray that you continue to, to get us closer and closer to your best no matter where we are right now. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, with the prayers and intercessions of all your saints. Here's Lord, as we pray thankfully, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.